Uh, okay, yes, I, I'm here until Saturday night, actually. So if you, I mean, my, mm, my time on Saturday is completely free. So if you want to talk on Saturday, I don't know if people are around on Saturday. So if you want to talk, let me know in advance so I can plan. Because, if, I mean, if nobody's around, maybe I will join <laughs> people going out for tourism. But, uh, but I'm, 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 I'm happy to stay and talk. So please let just let me know in advance. Okay. Um, now, what uh, what we did yesterday? Okay. So in the first lecture, we studied the dynamics of a liquid in infinite dimension, and we obtained. Okay, we obtained dynamical equations, and from the dynamical equations, we we obtained an equation for the plateau of the mean square displacement in the glass phase, and this is the equation. So we have one over rho essentially equal to some function of the plateau d. So d is the long time limit of the mean square displacement in the glass. And this function has some expression. In terms, it's an integral with a function q. And this function q is the convolution of a Gaussian with the exponential of the potential. So here I introduce the new notation. So gamma d is a Gaussian with variance d in small d dimensions. Okay, so it's a spherical uh, Gaussian, it's a rotational invariant Gaussian. In, in d dimensions with uh, variance large d. And this means a convolution. Okay. So you essentially have to convolute the Gaussian with the exponential of the potential, you get q, then you have to put q in this uh, integral and you get f. And I told you something you can do on mathematics and should be easy. Okay, so this, is, this was from the dynamics. And so when this equation has a solution, then we have dynamical arrest and we are, we are in the glass. And when there is no solution, then there is diffusion and, and we are in the liquid. So from, from the maximum of, the, of this function, you can obtain the glass transition point. That was the first lecture. And then yesterday, in the second lecture, we started to um, try to uh, reobtain this result without having to solve the dynamics. And this is the so-called state-following formalism. Uh, as I said yesterday, it was introduced in a paper by Franz and Paris in 95. And this... So, and the idea is that you start with a configuration Y that is taken in equilibrium at some initial state point, rho G, T, G. And this point represents, if you want, the last configuration that, you, that was visited by your system in equilibrium. So you can think that you are cooling your system, you are staying in equilibrium. Then at some point, you, go out, I mean, you, you get stuck in a glass. And once you are stuck in the glass, okay, so this is your last equilibrium configuration. This is why I'm calling it rho GTG, because it's kind of the glass transition point. I will come back on that. And then I want to, now I say, okay, now I'm stuck in a glass. So I want to study the thermodynamics of this glass that I assume to be a stable uh, free energy basin or energy basin. So I have a configuration X now that is taken in equilibrium, but a dif at a different state point, rho T. And in order to constrain x to be in the, in the mm, glass basin selected by y, I add the constraint that x and y should be close. For example, that the mean square displacement should be equal to some prescribed value dr. r is for relative um, to the original configuration. I keep talking and uh, <laughs> let's hope it will work. Okay. So, uh, so this is what we want to do. And then we want to compute the thermodynamics of x. And we say that in order to do, uh, we want to compute the free energy of x, but y plays the role of a quench disorder for, for x. So we have to average the free energy over the quench disorder. The free energy is the log of the partition function, so we have to introduce replicas, which we did. And in the end, I hope I convinced you that in order to extract the free energy of the glass, what you have to do is to compute the free energy of 1 plus s replicas and I will call n equal 1 plus s, so n is the total number of replicas. So you have 1 plus s replicas, and you want to compute the free energy. s is the number of replicas that you have to introduce on top of the... So y is one replica, this is the reference, and you have to put s additional replicas. So you have 1 plus s replicas, and the partition function, the total partition function is an integral over x1, which is y. So you have uh, the first replica is y. So y, x1 is a temperature Tg and density rho g, so it has a potential Vg. So remember, I select the density by setting the interaction scale in the potential. 
for convenience, so that I have the same number of particles in, in all configurations. And then I have the S It means that V depends on a length scale that, that is associated to rho g. I mean, in, in order to select the density, you can keep the number of particles fixed and the volume fixed, but you can change the, the sigma, I mean, the interaction scale of the potential. So I'm just setting a, a different potential for the two. So this one will have a length scale different from the length scale of the other one. For example, if I want to... But if you, if you don't want to change the density, you can think that they are the same density and they have the same potential. It's easier, just change the temperature. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Trivial. So X1 is Y, um, and it is at temperature Tg, and then I have the S other replicas that are, uh, they call XA, A goes from 2 to S plus 1, and they have potential V and temperature T. And then I have to put this constraint, and I can do it in two different ways. One is to put a delta function to impose the constraint. It's a microcanonical ensemble. Or I can put exponential of minus lambda times the, the function D, and this would be a canonical ensemble. Okay, and once I, I, I have this partition function for this object, then I should uh, compute the free energy, just take the log, and then I should expand in S. So this I can do for, I can do this calculation for integer S, but then I should do somehow an analytic continuation to real S, expand in S, and the linear order in S gives me the free energy of the glass. The, for, the zero order in S is the free energy of the liquid, but I mean, this one is trivial, we already discussed it in the first lecture. Okay, so what is the structure of this uh, partition function that I have to compute? So I have these n replicas, and the interaction, you see that here I have a factor of exponential of minus beta v, and I have a factor of exponential of minus beta v for each of the other replicas, so I, they are in mean, the exponential of the... The product of exponential is the exponential of the sum, so I have to sum all these... Ah, sorry, this is, uh, this is the total potential. So I have to sum all the, so the total potential will be the sum over all the replicas of the pair potential for each replica. And, and this is a sum of pair potentials, okay? So this, all this is the total potential here. And then I have the constraint. So I, I will use the canonical formulation. So I, uh, the constraint, you see, it's exponential of lambda times, and so D is the sum, is the mean square displacement. So it is the sum over I of Xi minus xi square. It's, this is the, the mean square displacement. n times d is the sum over all particles of the mean square displacement of the particle. So this gives me a term like this. I have the sum over all the particles, and I have a sum over all the replicas, but only from 2 to n. And this gives me a, a kind of harmonic coupling between replica a and replica 1. Yes. No, no, uh, there is an A. Anyway, I mean, this is just, the, the idea is just this, that, so you see this is a sum of, uh, the, the total potential has two terms, uh, so you can think that you have these molecules, so here is, this is the interaction between two molecules, so think that you have uh, one molecule here, each molecule is made by a, an atom for coming from each of the replicas. So you have two molecules, and the atom number one of the replica one in, in the first molecule has an interaction with the atom number one in the other molecule, and this is a, a factor of Vg. And then each atom of, for example, of replica two is interacting with the corresponding one in replica two, so you have a, a line that corresponds to a V, and and then you have this, you have a connection between the atom one and atom uh, two, three, four, up to n in each uh, molecule. So this is, and this is a harmonic spring. So it's a rather simple molecular object. So you have molecules that are harmonic and they are interacting in this way. Okay, so now.
n is s plus 1. This goes from 1 to n, which is s plus 1, so you have all of them. And this goes from 2 to n because you only have, I mean, 1 is coupled to 2, 1 is coupled to 3, 1 is coupled. Okay, now I want to give you an idea of how you treat this thing uh, in a simple way. And, okay, so the, you can solve this exactly in infinite dimensions in the same way I discussed the thermodynamics of the simple liquid in the first lecture. Uh, I will not do the exact solution because it's a bit of work. Not so, not so much, but a bit of work. So I will do a simpler uh, calculation, which is based on a Gaussian uh, assumption for the distribution of the molecule. And OK, I don't want to give all the details. I would like just to give you the ideas. The details are boring. So the plan for the lecture is that I would like to spend half of the lecture finishing this calculation. And then I would like to show you some results, which is maybe more. Uh, in. Anyway, so the idea is, is that you that this term is a kind of chemical potential for the molecule because uh, you see it's a sum. You have one term like this for each molecule, so this is controlling the shape, the internal shape of the molecule. So it's it's an internal potential of the molecule. You can think to it as a chemical potential, and this is an interaction. So you can use this chemical potential, and you can do uh, a Legendre transformation as you do in the, usually in the video expansion. And what you get, I will write the result and then we can comment the result. So you transform from the chemical potential to the density. And so you introduce an object rho of x, which is a function of x1, x2, up to xn. And this is a molecular density. So if you want, this is the probability of finding a molecule in a position where the first atom is in x1, the second atom is in x2, and so on. So you have a video expansion for, in terms of this, where now the, the chemical potential disappears because it's fixed. I mean, it's Legend transformed into rho. And you have the interaction term, which is exactly like in the first lecture. And you have a Meyer function. And then, in principle, you have all the other videos, but I will stop here as, because I want to do the large dimensional limit and also because otherwise it's become, it becomes difficult to treat the other terms. And the Meyer function is just exponential of minus beta times the interaction, uh, minus one. So it contains a term for the first replica, then a product of terms for the other ones, minus one, and that's it. And now what I have to do, I have to minimize this, this free energy with respect to rho of x, okay? Is a molecule. No, 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 there is no more i. You know, when you do the video expansion, you start to have n body problem, and then you start to expand, and I mean, in, a density functional. This is a density functional, and the density now is the, is the density of one molecule. So it's the probability. It's the probability that in the liquid you find the molecule in some position. So this will be. This is a liquid, so the, the molecule can be anywhere, and so this will be translational invariant. But I will come back to that. But but then it, it also encodes the, the shape of the molecule. So what I have to do is that I have to uh, now I have to minimize this with respect to rho. And then I have to impose the, I have to determine the rho in such a way that it respects the constraint. So I want to impose this constraint. But I will show you a simple way to do that, um, which is the following. So I, first I have to use translational invariance. Translational invariance means that if, if I, that if the system is a liquid, when I, if I translate the molecule, the, the, the density is the same. 
So this means I can introduce relative displacements. I call UA equal to XA minus X1. So if you want to have your molecule, there is X1 coupled to all the other replicas. And I just and I call U the, the distance between X1 and X2, for example. This will be two. And um, and then the molecule can be translated everywhere. So you see that the so I will change variables from x1, xn to x1, u2, un. So instead of fixing the position of all the atoms, I fix the position of the first atom and then I fix the relative distance. But then rho should not depend on x1 because the, 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 the system is transitional invariant. So rho of x can be written as rho, some constant rho, which is the, this is a number, this is the, the density of molecules, times pi of u. And pi of u does not depend on x1. And it's also normal, you can check that it is, uh, I mean, the normalization is such that pi of u should be normalized to 1. So pi of u is the probability distribution of the fluctuations of the distances in the molecule. U is the displacement. Mm -hmm. OK, so this is the first thing. And then, uh, and then I will uh, do this Gaussian uh, approximation. So the Gaussian approximation is to just I assume that pi of u is a Gaussian. So I say pi of u is going to be equal to 1 over 2 pi to the power s times the, de the, the determinant of some matrix A to power d over 2 times the exponential of minus 1 half sum over a b u a a, A, B, the minus 1, U, B. So this is the most general uh, Gaussian that you can write if you have variables. That, that is, okay, this, is, this has to be, okay, I, so using now rotational invariance, actually. So this is the, this is the most general Gaussian that I can write that preserves also the rotational invariance. So I can rotate the molecule and pi of u should not change. So this is a function only of the scalar product. So here UA, the, the spatial, the spatial index of UA are contracted with the one of UB. And this is a scalar matrix A, A, B. So you see that this is a, a I have UA equal to zero. But this is reasonable because uh, I mean the system is isotropic, so x2 can be everywhere with respect to x1. And then I have ua dot ub. Ah, sorry, I'm using random notations for vectors. ua dot ub is equal to a a b. And I have a general a a b. And this is the normalization. Okay. So this is not, uh, I'm not claiming that this is exact in infinite dimensions, but it, it will reproduce the exact result, and this can be understood, but I will not discuss it. So anyway, you can take it as an approximation. Um, I, I'm imposing them because I want to consider a liquid uh, of molecules. And the idea is that, I mean, the reason why I want to consider liquid of molecules is that I, this liquid, I introduced this liquid as an average over all the glasses. So I know that the glasses, on average, are statistically uh, invariant under translations and rotations. OK. Yes, the, the fact that it is Gaussian. Yes, the, the point is that, okay, the interaction is Gaussian, but the density does not need to be Gaussian. I mean, the original interaction is a spring, 
but there is also an interaction between particles. So in principle, the shape of the molecule could be non-Gaussian, but I'm assuming the simplest thing that is Gaussian. Because the, the, you have two, for example, you have two atoms with a spring, but the two atoms of this molecule are also interacting with the two atoms of the other molecules, and this could couple to the um, vibrations and create a non-Gaussian shape. But I'm assuming that this does not happen. So I, I told you that I should minimize this free energy with respect to rho. So now I assume the particular shape for rho, so, and I have these parameters A, so I should minimize with respect to A. I'm doing a kind of variational treatment. So I should compute F as a function of A, of this matrix A, and then I should minimize with respect to A. Now the calculation of F um, is, is quite simple at this point. I, I just sketch you, I sketch the details for, for you, and then maybe you can do it as an exercise. Um, so the first thing you can do is compute the ideal gas term. So in the ideal gas term, okay, the, the, the integral of rho is trivial. Is the integral of rho of x is just rho, so it's a constant. I'm not interested in constants. I want to know the dependence on a, of f on a. So what I have to compute is the integral of rho of x log rho of x. So you do, you do the transformation to u, you get rid of x1 that gives you a volume, and what you get is that minus f, so small f is, the, is big F divided by n, or by the volume, and this will be something like integral over u of pi of u log of pi of u. And you see that this is trivial if pi is Gaussian, because the log of pi has a term which is essentially the logarithm of the determinant of a, which is a constant, and then the integral of pi is 1. So this will give you d over 2 log that a. And then you have another term where you have the log of the exponential, so you have to compute the, the log of pi will contain this term that you have to average over pi, but once you average over pi, you get a, so you get sum over AB of A, AB times A minus 1, AB, which is essentially 1. I mean, it's the trace of the identity, it's a constant. So if you forget constants, that's what you get from the ideal gas term. And then you have to compute the interaction term. So the interaction term is going to be 1 half. Okay, you, again, you get rid of the x1. Here, you, you cannot completely get rid of it because you have x and y. So you can, but everything is a function of the difference. So you can check that you can write it in this way. So R here is going to be x1 minus y1. So it's the distance between the two central atoms in the molecule. It's this distance here. You, you can check, this is really easy. And then you get the convolution of the of all the rest, so you get an integral over du of pi of u. Uh, let me put an a here. Uh, you get the pi of u times the um, uh, product from a equal 2 to s plus 1 of exponential of minus beta v of r plus u a minus 1. So this is the Meyer function, and the only thing is that here you get pi of 2a, and the reason why, why you get 2a is just that you have two densities, so you have two pi's, but the, the convolution of two Gaussians is a Gaussian with twice the variance, so this will double the variance. So you get this. Now, okay, that's, the, that's your expression. Now, the problem is that now what you have to do is one, Minimize this object, minimize this object over a matrix A, A, B. This is a S times S matrix. Okay? And then, sorry, just a second. And then you have to, to continue. So you have to do this for, for any S, which is in, in the, for any integer S. And you have to continue this to, to S real and expand around S equal to zero. Uh, 
Ah, sorry, sorry. Yes. So, thank you. And this is the. No, uh, all this is the. I mean, the point is that the the integral of uh, pi is one. So the in the Meyer function you have the product of the potentials minus one. And the terms with minus one will go through the pi because pi is normalized to one. So it will become really a one. And then this is the convolution of pi with the potential part of the Meyer function. Okay. Yes. Pi to A. Uh, why is 2a? Because I have two pi. I have pi of x and pi of y. So the molecule x is fluctuating and the molecule y is also fluctuating, but the fluctuations are Gaussian. And in the Meyer function, I have the difference of x minus a. So this will become, if you want, this will become x1 minus y1, which is what I called r. So xa minus ya is going to become r plus ua, which is the fluctuation of the x minus va, which is the fluctuation of y. But this, this variable is a difference of two Gaussians, and, but, but the, these Gaussians are independent because I have two independent copies of the pi. So the difference of two Gaussians is a Gaussian with, the, with twice the variance. So I, I can call this... Yes. Uh, you are right, but I don't know. I mean, if, perhaps if you keep asking questions, it will become easier. But I mean, R is the difference between X1 and Y1. And then you see that then I have, so I have an, an interaction, which is a direct interaction between the centers. This is this VG of R, this term here. And then I have, I have here I have uh, UA, which is the, fluctuation between x1 and the one of the atoms, which is then convoluted with this factor, and then convoluted again on the other side. I'm just saying that this com double convolution is redundant because both things are Gaussian, and the convolution of two Gaussians is a Gaussian with the doubled, with twice the variance of each of them. So I just write it once, but I double the variance. So here I have a convolution of the exponential of minus beta v times uh, one single object. Okay. Anyway, if you are not convinced, uh, I mean, we can, we can discuss it uh, anytime privately, and I mean, it's just details of calculation, so I don't... It's not very, very important. Uh, now, the problem is that the counter there is, is not working, so I uh, don't know. Uh, it's 10, so I... I started at 9.30, right? So I have, I have time. Okay. So I was saying that now, okay, now we have this object, which has some, it has some expression, you can compute it, but the problem is that now you have to minimize over A for any integer N, and then you have to do analytic continuation. So this step could be done for S equal to 3, 4. It starts to become tricky when S is 100. Uh, but then the analytic continuation is a problem. So what can you do? Okay, you, have to, you can use a symmetry that, that you have in the problem to simplify everything, which is the symmetry between replicas. So So you see that you have a symmetry in the problem, because you see that from the very beginning, when I introduced the replicas, they are all equivalent. So I, I had the logarithm of z, and I wrote the logarithm of z, the partition function, as z to the power s. And then I, <clears throat> this z to the power s was written as a product of s copies of the same thing. So of course I can exchange them. So the labeling of the replicas is completely relevant. I call this one replica 2, this one replica 3, but I could call this one 3 and this one 7 and exchange the labels as I want. So this partition function has a symmetry, which is the group of all the permutations of S replicas. Okay, so if I have a symmetry and I have a potential 
that depends on a matrix that has, and, and the potential has this symmetry, and I want to minimize it. The simplest assumption is that the minimum respects the symmetry. So this is the case of, for example, if you are in the Ising model, you have the free energy as a function of m, and you know that it has a symmetry without field. It has a symmetry because up magnetization or down magnetization are the same. So in the simplest situation, the minimum of the free energy is symmetric under, under uh, reversal of the spin, so it's, it is in m equal to zero. In the more complicated situation, you can have that your function is symmetric, but the minimum is not symmetric. And then in that case, you will have one minimum, but you also have another minimum, which is the one that you can obtain by applying the symmetry. So in our situation, we have the same, uh, exactly the same situation. So the determinant is symmetric if you change the, the numbering of the lines and the columns. This object is also symmetric, you can check. So this function is symmetric. So there are two situations. Either the replica symmetry is not broken, so the minimum has to be symmetric, or it is broken, and then this means that I have many minima, and they are transformed into each other by the permutation of the rows. I will not discuss the second case. I will consider that the simplest case is that I, I'm replica symmetric. And then what happens? Then I, I have to construct a matrix A, A, B, which is invariant under exchange of the lines and columns. So there is not much you can do. Uh, a, A, B must necessarily be, I mean, you can have something on the diagonal. So let's call it uh, A, zero. So you will have some A, zero on the diagonal. And it must be the same for all the uh, elements on the diagonal, because if I change replica 1 into replica 2, then it should be the same. And then I, I can have something off diagonal, and it must be the same everywhere. Because, for example, the element A1, 2 must be equal to the element A3, 4, because I can change 1 into 3 and 2 into 4. So the only thing that matters in this matrix A, A, B is whether A and B are equal or different. Is this fine? And, okay, now, I just, uh, okay, so now, what I have is that A, A, A is the average of U, A square. So this is the square displacement between replica zero, uh, replica one, sorry, and any other of the replicas. But now you remember that I had this constraint. I wanted to impose that the, the square displacement between replica one and any other replica is exactly DR. So I should, so if you want, this matrix is not completely free because I have to remember that in the original problem when I wanted to minimize over row, I, I, I have this constraint. So I want to minimize over row with this constraint. So the easiest way is just to say, okay, this, is, this has to be DR by the constraint. So I, I will put the R on the diagonal. And then off diagonal, what happens off diagonal? I have UA dot UB. But you can see, uh, I can write this as UA square minus one half UA minus UB square. Why? I mean, because if I expand here, I have ua square plus ub square, but ub squ is equal to ua square. So this will cancel the ua square. And then I have minus 2 ua ub, and I have a minus 1 half, so I, I obtain the correct result. So this is going to be equal to dr, this term here. And then I have minus 1 half and this is the displacement between replica A and replica B. And this is what I call D originally, because D now is the distance between any pair of replicas, which is not one. And this represents the mean square displacement inside the glass basin. So if you want, DR represents the, the typical displacement between one configuration and the original reference configuration that you used to prepare the glass. And D represents the mean square displacement between two independent configurations of the same glass. 
Now, dr is constrained, is the parameter I want to impose, while d is free. So I have to minimize the free energy over d. d and dr. So then now it's very... Yes, exactly. So now, now I skip the details because it, now it becomes really boring. But the only, I mean, it's really... So this matrix is, you want to get the determinant of this matrix. So this is very easy to diagonalize. Because you can see that one, the vector of all ones is an eigenvector. You just apply it and you check. And any vector orthogonal to this one is also an eigenvector, with the, and they are all degenerate. So you have only two eigenvalues, one that is associated to this vector, and one that is associated to any vector orthogonal to this one. So the determinant is straightforward, you compute it. And then you have to compute this convolution. So I, I give you a hint, then you try to do it by yourself if you want. The hint is very simple. You have, you have random variables u that are, that, are, that, are, that are correlated, but they are correlated in a trivial way. So what you can do, you can write u a as u plus delta u a, where u, big U, is a Gaussian variable with variance dr minus one half t, and these are independent with variance d, one half t probably. So if you do this, now you have two, yes, so now you have two, so you decompose u in this way, and now you have to convolute this Gaussian with this object, but now you see that you can break this convolution into dependent convolutions of the delta u that are now independent Gaussian, so it's a product, with each of these factors. So I just to give you the result, this will produce a, a, a q of d and beta to the power s. Uh, it will produce a q of d, uh, not of d, uh, of uh, yes, of d and beta to the power s, because you have s factors like this, and q is the convolution of a Gaussian with the exponential of minus beta v. So the first convolution will get this, but then you have to make an additional convolution with, with u, and this will so will this will give you an additional convolution with a, a Gaussian of variance two dr minus d that will be applied to this object. Then you have minus one, and then you have to multiply by this factor. Okay, now if you are lost, don't worry; it's not important. It's just. The first one, no, and the second, yes, and the, and the dependence on dr is here. Because delta u is, is not, does not depend on dr. So in the end, you get this. You get one alpha, and here you get the logarithm of the determinant of a, which is, as I told you, is very simple to compute. Now, the important point is that now this object is not anymore a complicated uh, function of a matrix that you have to analytically continue. You see that now this is an analytic function of s. Because now all the dependence on the number of replicas becomes a product. So you have q to the s, and the determinant, you can see, it's, an, it's also an analytic function of s. So you don't have to do any, I mean, you did the analytic continuation by assuming the replica symmetry. So now you can expand this thing in s, as I told you there. So in order to get the free energy of the glass, you have to expand in powers of s. And when you do that, you obtain I will write you the result. So the, the final result for the glass free energy, minus beta times the free energy of the glass. This is going to be, uh, you get d over 2 times the logarithm of pi e d. And these are constants, you don't, don't care about them. Then you get plus d over 2 times 2 dr minus d over and then you get plus, here you get the density that I perhaps forgot everywhere, but rho omega solid angle. Oh, okay, let's drop the solid angle. You get rho over 2 times the integral over r, and then you get d 
this thing, and the expansion in S, this will be exponential of S log Q, so it will just produce a log here. Log Q. And that's the final result. So now this is a function of D and DR, and you want to minimize over D, and you want to plot it as a function of DR to get the... Yes, this is in the limit of S going to zero, so that is, this is now really the, the thing we want to have. So we can forget now all the rest. And, and now... So the details of all this are not important, but I wanted to show you the calculation to show you the... Uh, unfortunately, in this form, it's not written anywhere. Uh, it's hidden in many, many places, but not... Uh, so, yes, uh, um, I, I, it will be in the book. I can give you uh, the book if you ask me. If you send me an email, I, I can give you the book. So this is the... Um, I mean, the book is not finished, but I can give you what is currently the draft of the book. So, okay, this is the, the result. Now, um, now... Just a few comments, and then we move to the slides to show you some results. Yes. Ah, there will, well, there will be just an S. Here. So this log Q would be a Q to the S, and the determinant would have a, a dependence. These terms come from the determinant. You want, okay, I can give you the expression of the determinant. You get log that a is equal to um, sorry, just one second. Log that a is something like s times dr plus s minus one t over two. This is the this is the isolated eigenvalue associated to the vector one, and then you have uh, ah sorry without the log. And then you have d over 2, which is the degenerate eigenvalue associated to the orthogonal space to the power s minus 1. So you take this, you take the log, you take the derivative with respect to s, and you get this. Okay. okay. Um, so now, the, just now a few comments before we move to the slides. Um, so the first thing is that maybe now you start to see the dynamical equation. So in order to get the equation that we obtain from the dynamics, what you have to do is simply to consider the case in which you prepare a system in a state and you run the dynamics in the same state. So you put... Yes. Yes, no, no, it's the same Q. That's why... Q is still there, but so that, that's why Q is... Uh, yes. So... If I want to study the, um, the dynamics in equilibrium, I have to set rho g equal to rho and tg equal to t. And in that case, you can see that the replica one becomes identical to the others. So you also can see, it's easy to see that, the, that when you minimize this thing over d, the solution is just d equal to dr. So you have a single d. And uh, so you can see that here you get gamma d, and here you get log q, and you can integrate by parts to bring this gamma act, to act on this other thing, and this will create a q. So you get q log q. So yes, but v is the same. V is the same now. If you so so you get essentially d over two log d. Here you get this log d, this factor becomes 1, and you don't care, it's a constant. And plus rho over 2, integral over dr. So this act on the other side and becomes a q of d. This is a log. Minus 1. So now... Yes. Uh, so here, this is a rotation. This is a vector. So you have to. Uh, sorry, Q depends on R. Also, I forgot to. So. 
now you, can, you should plot this as a function of d, and this will be your Franz Parisi potential. So you can do it on Mathematica if you want, for a, for a potential that you choose. No, it's the solution. If, 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 you impose that there are, if you impose that you prepare the system in a state and you run the dynamics in the same state, then you can minimize the free energy and you can check that this is the solution. And it's due to the fact that you have an additional symmetry. So now this function f has a shape like this, uh, as a function of d, which actually is dr, to be precise, because d is what I minimized. And, but, but okay, the solution is d equal to dr, but dr is my variable, okay? So you should, you should plot it as a function of dr, and it has a minimum. And this minimum is the one that you are interested in. And I think Ludovic will discuss this better than me, but okay. This will be the complexity. But anyway, the point is that you have two minima, actually. Uh, I mean, you have one minimum that is at finite d, but you also have another minimum at infinite d. Infinite d means that your configuration x is diffusing away from y, so you are not really imposing your constraint. And so this means that this, this is the liquid. Okay, the, the, the minimum that you have at infinite d is the liquid, and this one is the glass. So you want, you want to choose this one and not this one. OK. Other comments? So OK, if you, if you take the minimum over dr of this thing, you recover the equation that is written there. Because you see, you get 1 over d equal to an integral of, so this d log d, when you derive over, uh, when you differentiate over d, will give you this, this object here, this log q times the derivative of q over d. It is in principle under derivative, but you can check that it is, it is zero. So you recover the same equation that you get from the dynamics, which is uh, uh, non-trivial, as I told you. At the beginning, I mean, this formalism is a thermodynamic formalism where we made a lot of assumptions. Uh, we assume that the dynamics is sampling the glass state in equilibrium and so on, and so we can check that at least in this, uh, at least in this infinite dimensional limit, it's, it is correct. This is a replica symmetric for the moment. So there is a problem of terminology in the community because actually it is a little bit broken because the replica one is special. So if you do a thermodynamic calculation, it would be a one RSB. It is what people used to call a one RSB. But in, in this language of the Franz Parisi potential, we used the, everything was symmetric. We didn't break. So it, let's, let's stick to the replica symmetric. This is the replica symmetric solution. Yes, yes, that, that's one possibility. There is another possibility, which is, I mean, if, if you do it in the Monasson formalism, then it's a one RSB. But OK, then it's a problem of translation and convention between formalism. I will, this will confuse everybody, so let's avoid it. OK. Yes, exactly. So that's the second comment I wanted to, to make. This is a metastable minimum. So now the glass is metastable with respect to the liquid. It's not a real minimum. Um, why? So you can check that the energy of the glass... So from this, you can compute the energy of the glass, because this is a function of rho t, rho g, t, g. So you can fix rho g, t, g, and you can differentiate with respect to t. And the, deriv the derivative of the free energy with respect to t gives you the energy. So you can compute the energy of the glass from this. And you can check that it's actually equal to the energy of the liquid when you, in, in this, if you prepare the, the glass in the same state point where you follow it. So the energy of the glass is the, is the same as the energy of the liquid. So this difference can only come from the entropy. So it means that the glass, the, 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 if you want, it means that the liquid has a lower entropy, uh, sorry, higher entropy than the glass, because its free energy is smaller and the energy is the same. So this difference is precisely the difference between the entropy of the glass and the entropy of the liquid, and it is what you call complexity, and it will be the equilibrium complexity. So really, the, the picture is that you have your liquid, 
and your liquid is made by many glasses. But all these glasses have the same energy, which is also the energy of the liquid. They have some entropy. This is phase space. Sorry. And, and then the number of glasses that you have is the complexity. But I think Ludovic will come back on this. Um, so I think I'm done with my calculations. And now I would like to show you some results. So maybe, uh, can you? So, OK, uh, while it, turn, while it uh, powers on, um, the, so the summary of the blackboard part is that you have now, you have a dynamical formalism, you have a thermodynamical, uh, thermodynamical formalism. The two are equivalent. When it comes to making calculation, the thermodynamical one is much easier. So you can, I will use that one. But we are also working now on, on solving the dynamical equations to get the full dynamics, which is something that was not yet done. Um, and okay, now I just want to, to show you. So I mean, now you have this thing. Uh, it is a kind of black box. Uh, once you uh, take this, this is for a generic potential. So you can just now close your eyes, forget how I derived it, take the equation, run it on your computer, and choose the potential and compute all the kind of phase diagrams that you want. So that's what we did in the last few years, and I want to show you some examples. So the simplest example is, so this is a soft uh, sphere potential. Uh, OK, sorry, I, I, I wrote 12, but it's actually 4D. So it's the generalization to, OK, it's the, the generalization to arbitrary dimension of this potential. And then we take the limit of D to infinity. So I didn't discuss it, but when d goes to infinity, again, you can simplify these vectorial integrals into one-dimensional integrals, so everything becomes easier. Actually, they are already one-dimensional because you have rotational invariance, but anyway. So you, you compute the phase diagram, and this is uh, the typical glass uh, curve that you see in any review on glasses at the first page. So this is temperature, this is energy, uh, average energy. The black line is the liquid. So the liquid has, uh, has an energy that uh, comes from the liquid thermodynamics that I discussed in first lecture. So it's just um, secondarial, and you compute it. And then, um, so here is the dynamical transition. The dynamical transition is the point where you have a solution of this equation. So the, this thing starts to have a minimum. Above the dynamical transition, this as no minimum, okay? It's like this. So below the dynamical transition, you, you have a dynamical arrest. So this is the mode coupling transition, if you want. And below, you are arrested, at least in the field. But you can say, okay, as I discussed at some point before, I think answering to the question of Pulpul, you, you can think that in, in, in 3D, you will have a little bit of activation that will bring you a little bit below MCT. Or you can think that you are very smart and you use a very smart swap algorithm and you go very, very deep below the, the, the MCT. So you are in equilibrium at some point on the liquid branch. And now you say, OK, now I freeze the swap or I freeze my, I mean, I run a very a much shorter simulation or experiment and I, now I, I change the temperature. So now my system is confined into a glass and I can follow this glass in temperature. And what you see is that you can cool it. So if you cool it, nothing very interesting happens, it's essentially solid, essentially harmonic, the energy is essentially linear in T. Or you can eat it. If you, heat, if you eat it up, you see that you stay below the liquid energy, and this is something that is observed in uh, vapor deposit glasses, for example. Even in well annealed glasses, you can, if you heat them up fast enough, you see that the energy stays below, and then you see that you have a spinodal point. At the spinodal point, the, the energy becomes uh, the derivative of the energy becomes infinite, so you have an infinite specific heat, which you see in, in experiments, you see a strong peak of specific heat, usually when you heat, it, heat up a stable glass. Okay, so in mean field, this, is, this would be a true spinodal point. Of course, in, in finite dimensions, spinodals, Patrick will discuss, spinodals do not uh, really exist, but okay, we know how to handle this. So, OK, the other thing is that, OK, I said nothing really interesting happens when you cool. Actually, it's not completely true, because what can happen if you, OK, if you 
prepare a very well annealed glass here and you cool it down, really nothing happens. It's essentially an harmonic uh, solid. But if you prepare a not very well annealed glass, so if you stay close to TMCT at the beginning and then you go down, then actually you can break the replica symmetry. So I, I told you that you should start by doing the replica symmetry calculation, fine. But actually, you can check that there is a point where the replica symmetry breaks. And I, okay, I, I don't have time to go into the details of how it breaks, but it breaks. And physically, this is what is called the Garner transition. And it means that your glass basin is not anymore a pure uh, basin, I mean a, a well-defined minimum, but it breaks into sub-basins. Okay. Uh, so this is the phase diagram we obtained for this potential with um, uh, Camille Scaillet and uh, Ludovic. So it's published in 2019. Uh, yes, so if you take glasses that are very deep in the energy landscape, they don't do anything interesting. If you take glasses that are high in the energy landscape, you cool them a little bit and they become broken into many substates. And actually, the Gardner point coincides if you prepare a glass at TMCT, and, and that's the property of mean field, TMCT is a marginal point because you have zero modes. So immediately, if you cool this glass, it immediately becomes marginal. It's always marginal. It's always broken into many states. So this is a zoom of this part, okay? And then you can heat up and then you can see the... This is what happens for hard spheres, and already Patrick uh, show, showed this diagram. So it's the same diagram, except it's rotated by 90 degrees. And okay, in hard spheres, the control parameter is naturally the density or the vacuum fraction. And here it's the inverse of pressure. So you compress, this is the liquid, the pressure goes down. Uh, and then you have the, the MCT point. And if you go beyond MCT, you prepare a glass at this packing fraction. You turn off your swap or you uh, do a fast compression or cooling, and you can compress and you can decompress. If you decompress, again, you have a spinodal and then you melt into the liquid. And there is a paper by Ludovic Berthier and Chris Fullerton who did exactly this. They prepared very stable glasses of hard spheres. They decompressed and they studied the melting. So you can check, you can read this paper and check how different it is from a spinodal. I mean, they have a long, uh, long and deep discussion that I don't have time to reproduce. But anyway, at least in the field, you have some hint that there is some kind of uh, strange phenomenon going on here. And then you can compress. And if you compress, again, you have a Gardner phase. And now the difference with respect to a thermal glass is that these are hard spheres. So if you compress, at some point, you are uh, going to compress against their core, and they will jam. So each of these glasses will jam into a point uh, where the pressure is infinite, so you have a line of jamming points. And this line is all marginal, so it's all in, in the broken replica symmetry region. And this is going to be important. And uh, what else? Uh, okay, on this diagram... Uh, you want the reference? No. But if you decompress, uh, I mean, for, for, for sort of a real hard sphere glass, there is sort of a limit to, I mean, it, it, it will become the liquid before you hit the yes, spinodal. There, there right? is a nucleation phenomenon that takes place before the spinodal. So I'm curious if it happens at dens up, if it, if it happens uh, at densities below the, the marginal glass. The transition. Yeah, the problem is that, I mean, to be quantitative, we, we should do, I mean, this is in infinite dimensions, yeah. and you see that the numbers are uh, sure. whatever numbers. Uh, right? No, no, but I'm saying. Like, so I, one should compute this in, in 3D and really get some prediction for the spinodal in the polydispersed system that they are using. So it's. No, but they, they did it for 3D, correct? Hmm? They did it for 3D? Yes. And, and if you just sort of say 50, 58% is the glass trend, the lowest glass. Ah, okay, yes, density, you could rescale all the diagram. You, do you actually go below, well below? Yes, the, yes, one could check, yeah, that's interesting. And the other thing would be to try to run the compression in uh, dimension 4, 5, 6, where the spinodal is, should be more visible, but okay. 
phone is interested in checking that there is really some spin other phone. Okay, then, okay, we have our spheres, we have soft spheres, we can do harmonic spheres. So harmonic spheres are this potential. This is the typical potential that is used for jamming. And so there is a paper by Biroli and Urbani <coughs> where they computed the mode coupling line for this potential. So you have a liquid and you have a glass. This is temperature and density. And we have a paper that is about to appear, I think in one or two weeks, uh, where we prepare glasses in different regions of this diagram and we follow them in temperature and in density. So if you want, this is Tg, rho g, uh, phi g, you can prepare a point in equilibrium here, and then you can draw a phase diagram of the glass in t temperature and density. And this gives you, essentially, depending on where you are on this phase diagram, you can describe dense liquid. So this is the soft sphere limit. You can have hard spheres. This is the zero temperature limit. You can have soft colloids, grains, emulsions. So you can more or less put all the different glassy materials into the same phase diagram, and you can explore the, what happens to the glass when you compress it. I want to mention also that you can take the square well potential, and this is a paper with Mauro Sellito, and unfortunately <laughs> comes 10 years after MCT, so essentially you, we just reproduce MCT results. Um, so we have two glasses, attractive and repulsive glass. There is a region of coexistence, there is the, the a free singularity. I mean, it's exactly as in MCT. Ten years later, but okay. Just for complete. Yes, I'm just. I'm always taking this thing, and I'm using many different potentials, and I can do things. There is a nice paper by Ajime Yoshino just appeared where he, is, he does patchy colloids. So this requires more work because you have to add the orientational degrees of freedom. And he also finds interesting regions of coexistence between ori orientational glass, translational glass. So you can check the paper, it's very nice. Um, and now I want to mention a, a few other things. Uh, I'm not sure that my watch is doing fine in time. Ah, I have 20 minutes. Okay, I have plenty of time. So, okay. So I want to discuss a little bit more what happens at jamming, okay? So now we go back to our spheres, and we want to study what happens when you approach this point. So as I told you, there is a replica symmetry break in transition before. Um, but, okay, so jamming means that, okay, you have your particles, you compress the particles, and then at some point the particles touch. If they are hard spheres, you cannot compress anymore here because the pressure is infinite. If they are a bit soft, then you can keep compressing, but then you create mechanical um, repulsion between the particles. So you can think to these tennis balls as a jammed, typical jammed configuration, even if they are a bit soft, but okay. Um, so this was studied by Bernal first in the 60s. Sorry. Sure, they also, yes. They also have friction. Okay, so this is, uh, of course, I will study the frictionless case. No, no, you're right. It's important. I mean, the geometry of this, but it will, I mean, the, 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 the contacts will be different. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I agree. No, no, true. So let's forget about the tennis balls. Um, <laughs> you can, okay, you, I mean, it's a, of course, it's a bit idealized if you don't put friction, because then any kind of macroscopic system will have friction, but... I assume I should answer yes, right? It's not my computer, so I don't know. Okay. Anyway. Ah, sorry. Um, so, anyway, so this jamming transition has been studied a lot in the last uh, 20 years. Um, and what um, is uh, known now, uh, today, is that you have a very strange, I mean, you have critical exponents around the, this transition in particular. The, the mean square displacement plateau, so this is what I call T, goes to zero at jamming. Okay, this is normal because, I mean, if you start in the glass, then you have a, a plateau, but if the part, I mean, the plateau is the vibration of the particles, but if, if you have hard spheres and they don't move, the plateau is zero, there is no displacement. But the point is that it goes to zero in a very non-trivial way. It goes to zero like one over the pressure to some power K. And k is a non-trivial uh, exponent, I will show you. And also, if you focus on 
infinite pressure, so you are at jamming, you can look to the distribution of forces between particles. So you would say, okay, the forces are infinite, yes, but you, you can rescale all the forces by the pressure. The pressure is going to infinity, but then the ratio of the forces to the pressure is going to be finite. So you can look to the distribution of that in the limit of infinite pressure. And this is also as a power law behavior at small forces uh, with an exponent theta. And finally, you can take the, your packing and there will be gaps between particles. So you can have a sphere that is touching other spheres. But then maybe there is a sphere here, okay? So these two will have a gap H. So I call H the, it's not the distance, it's really the gap. So you can have arbitrarily small gaps, and actually you have many of them. The, the distribution of gaps, so this is the pair distribution, but written in terms of H, is divergent at small H. So you have these three exponents, K, gamma, and theta. And there is a pretty beautiful series of papers by Mathieu Viar and co-workers where they, using assum the assumption that these packings are marginally stable in their mechanical properties. Now I'm not talking about replica things, but really concrete mechanical properties of the packing. So you assume that these packings um, are essentially, they, just, they have exactly the number of contacts that you need to have a stable network. And under this assumption, with a little bit of work, they can prove two scaling relations between these exponents. And the idea is that essentially, when you are very close to jamming, the motion goes by opening a force. So you take one small force, you break the contact, then you move a little bit, and then you form another contact. And when you form another contact, this is the distribution that is important. So this is why you can connect the probability of opening a small force, the probability of closing a small gap, and the mean square displacement, essentially. You, you can connect these three things into two scaling relations. But fortunately for us, there was one exponent that remained undetermined from this. So you have three exponents and two scaling relations. And it was measured numerically. But So it turns out that we can compute this exponent. So if you do the replica symmetric calculation from this, you get jamming, but you get plain wrong exponents. But now, if you take into account that you have to break the replica symmetry and you do some work, then you can uh, obtain these values. And these are, I mean, the, the scaling relations are not exactly built into the theory in infinite dimensions. In the end, you can do some work and you can guess that they are there. But we didn't really prove, I mean, we can prove one of the two, but not the other. But anyway, the values of the exponents, if you put them, we have the exponents with arbitrary precision, and you can put the exponents into the scaling relations, and, and you can check that they satisfy the scaling relations. Uh, I, I, there's something that needs a comment. So these are now still d equal to infinity limit. Uh, yes, so these are the exponents uh, in exponents. the uh, d equal to infinity limit. Yeah, so these uh, exponents are in the d going to infinity limit. Yes, yes. Right? But, uh, and of course, uh, in terms of the arguments above, it's not very clear what dimensionality plays, a role, what yes. role dimensionality plays, but, but these are now found to be fairly accurate for 3D. Yes, that's the next slide. Right? But so, yes, I mean, if you check the arguments of... How do we understand that, I guess? Good, good question. I mean, if you check the arguments of Mathieu, they are essentially independent of the dimension of space. You can ask why, but that's a fact. And, okay, now these exponents are in infinite dimensions, but I want to show you some results that maybe Patrick will show again, but I don't know. Um, so here are simulations of our spheres in dimension from 2 to 10, and this is the, the plateau, sorry, it's called delta Y, but this is D, versus pressure. So you see that we have six decades in pressure, and this is the exponent, the black line is the exponent predicted by infinite dimensions, and you see it works very well. And you see that you can distinguish it from free half, that was the exponent that was believed to be the exponent, uh, the correct exponent before we did the calculation. Actually, when we started the calculation, we wanted to prove free half, and for a long time we, we, we were convinced it was free half, so we did a lot of work to prove it was free half. <laughs> In the end, <laughs> It turned out that some, some, I mean, we had the code to solve the full RSB, it didn't work with free half, and then it was 1.4, which is 
very close to free alpha, but not, not free alpha. And you can distinguish it. This is the G of R. It's the cumulative. It's the integral of G of R in dimension from 3 to 10. And you see at small gaps. So this is, this is the gap, H, is R minus 1. And you see that you have this power law. And the blue line is the gamma predicted from infinite dimensions. And this is the distribution of forces. This is the cumulative. So you have it in 3D and in 4D, but it's the same in all higher D. And uh, that's the prediction of in field, you have to do a little bit of work here, and I think Patrick maybe is going to discuss what you have to do. No, okay. But you can check the paper and you can see. We have to eliminate some spurious localized modes that you have in, in low dimension, but okay. I mean, spurious modes that are not in the infinite dimensional theory, but that could be interesting. But these are localized modes that do not contribute, for example, to the shear and so on. So, okay, in order to get these critical properties of jamming, we need to include this replica symmetry breaking. We can compute these exponents analytically. And, okay, it's very surprising, as uh, Sri pointed out, that the infinite dimensional prediction works very well down to d equal 2. It's, to the best of my knowledge, is one of the rare uh, instances where you can do full RSP calculation in mean field and get numbers that you can really test and you can really show that they agree with a, a finite dimensional um, results and why it's a mystery. Uh, so yeah, it's, I think, a, a direction for future work to understand why. And then I would like to show you a few additional results. So one is the complexity because, okay, that's the entropy, so it's the theme of the school. I'm sorry I didn't talk a lot about entropy, but it was underlying everything, but I didn't maybe stress it enough. So this is the complexity. This is the complexity for hard spheres. So you have a few lines. So the first line, this is the equilibrium complexity. So if you want, you prepare, you prepare your liquid. You are in the liquid phase. Okay. You are here. And you uh, go to some point. You are in equilibrium. And then you say, OK, what is the number of glasses that I have at this point? And this is some complexity. This is the equilibrium complexity that everybody measures in the glass community, OK? So it's what Kautzmann essentially did. I mean, with the warnings that Ludovic uh, already gave in part and will keep giving. But anyway, so this is the equilibrium complexity. I can define two other complexities uh, for our sphere. One is the Edwards complexity. So I say, OK, instead of looking to the equilibrium glass, I look to jammed states. And then I want to know at a given density how many stable jammed states I can have. So the, and the logarithm of this is the Edwards complexity. And I can also compute some hybrid complexity, which is the following. I take a, an equilibrium state here. I compress it down to this point. Now it's jammed. And I can say, OK, but at the beginning, I, I had the exponential number of states. So if I repeat, I mean, each of them will jam at some point. So I have an exponential number of jammed states. So what I can do is that I can define a complexity of jammed states, but not, I mean, in the Edwards case, you put a uniform weight, let's say, on, on, the, on the space of all possible states, jammed states, and, and then you compute the associated entropy. And here, it's a, it's instead, it's a dynamical procedure. I run the liquid up to some point. I assume I fall out of equilibrium here. I go down to jamming, and I say, OK, but the number of packings that I can produce in this way is equal to the number of glasses I had here. So I just take the glass complex and I shift it. So in the plot I showed you, I compare the three curves. Yes? No, but if you start with a glass, you go down the glass, the glass line. And if you have the Gardner transition. OK, true. The, the, I mean, so the, num the number of structures you produce is, is, is more. Uh, I guess the complexity remains the same, but that needs some explanation. OK. OK, a single glass can give rise to many packings. Calculating the complexity in a full RSB phase is, is an open problem. Uh, but people more or less believe that there is no finite complexity. So yes, you're right. So in principle, one, one glass can give many packings, but it should not be an exponential number of packings. It should be a 
power law in N or something like that. But it, this is a conjecture. Anyway, I just wanted to show you the free curves. So the, this one is the equilibrium complexity. So this is just uh, this difference between the glass minimum and the liquid. And this one, the, the one with uh, dashes, the, the, I mean, they are very close. This one is the one that you get just, you take this one and you shift it by saying, okay, this glass will become this parking, this glass will become this parking, and so on. So you shift. And the other one is the Edwards complexity. The Edwards complexity is computed by, uh, by another method, that is the method of Monasson. You have to do a little, uh, it, it's not more difficult, it's just a different thing, uh, but you can do it. So you can see that they are a little bit different, not very different. I mean, the Edwards one remains there for more, for lower densities. So this tells you a few things. The first one is that if you pre prepare a glass at MCT and you compress it, this is not going to be the maximum, uh, at least in this mean field, uh, Victor. This is not going to be the maximum of the Edward compressor. It's going to be a little bit more dense. And the other thing is that by doing this dynamical procedure of producing glasses by compression of the liquid, you produce a little bit less parkings than, than the equiprobable. So the, if you want... Yes, a little bit. Yes, it's a tiny effect, but it's there. So these are observations that I, f I know, I mean, are interesting observations, but I mean, it would be nice to have a more insight on, on that. For example, by solving the dynamics, be nice. And the last thing I want to discuss, if I have a few more minutes, uh, yes. The last thing I want to discuss is um, that you can generalize this formalism to uh, describe what happens to a glass under strain. So it's very easy, what you have to do is to do the same kind of calculation, but you take Y, so you take an equilibrium state, this selects a glass, and now you, you take X and you strain it. But, so Y will remain unstrained because it selects, if you want, the reference profile, the reference solid, and then X will be strained, and you keep this constraint. Actually, the constraint will be you have to remove from x the affine part. So you strain back x and you compare with y, and this will give you the non-affine displacement and you fix that the non-affine displacement is not too big, otherwise you are leaving the, the basin. So I want to show you just to, to conclude a few results that we get from that. So this is, these are now again our spheres. So this is the phase diagram I showed before without strain. We have uh, what we have done here now is to prepare a glass uh, at density 8, so it's this one. So at zero strain, you can follow this glass in compression up to jamming, so you, the glass is prepared here. This is density and strain. You prepare the glass at zero strain and density equal to 8 in these rescale units. You can compress up to jamming, and you can decompress down to melting but you can strain on top of that. So when you strain, you see that, that you have two possibilities. So this is the stress versus strain. I'm sorry, it's not very well visible. It's actually the inverse of, uh, okay, look to, the, yeah, look to the inset, it's better. This is stress strain in log scale. And what you see is that if you prepare your glass, compress a little bit, okay, compress a little bit and then you strain, then the stress grows and actually diverges at some point. So it, it means that your glass, at some point, jams under strain. And uh, instead, if you don't compress or if you decompress and you strain, then you have a maximum in, in the stress. So you have an overshoot of the stress, and then it, it, mel it uh, yields, so it, it breaks. And after that, we don't know what happens, because then you have to do the dynamics. So this thermodynamic formalism will not work. But, okay, but this already reproduces some observations that are made in glasses. First one is that, okay, if you strain a glass, you have an elastic regime, then you have an overshoot, and then you have some kind of uh, yielding. The yielding in this mean field picture is a spinodal as, as the melting. And of course, in real, it's not going to be a, a, a spinodal, it's going to be something more complicated. Typically, you have a shear band. I mean, there are uh, 
uh, recent nice papers uh, again from Ludovic where they took again they took very stable glasses, but and then they observed uh, very sharp shear bands. There were of course a lot of previous observations of shear bands and overshoots in this regime close to MCT. But if you are able to prepare very deep glasses, you see it really really well, and so you have this uh, picture and and. Also, I mean, you also have this prediction of shear timing, and uh, this is something that we tested numerically with um, Ajime Yoshino and Yuliang Jin. So we have a paper on archive this year, where okay, you don't see shear timing if you don't prepare well annealed glasses. So if you prepare, if your glass is not very well annealed and you stay here, then this point moves to zero and you don't have shear timing. So in order to see shear timing, you really need to have very well annealed glasses, and again we do now with, with swap. No, so exactly. So if you want here, you, you, if you prepare the glass, you start with the glass, you compress a little, a little bit. Now you apply the strain. You, if you can shear jam, and this is the blue line, you can yield, and this is the red uh, line. And there is a critical point that separates the two, essentially where this maximum diverges. But this, and so this is for phi equal to eight. If you decrease the preparation density, so you have not very well annealed glasses, then this point moves down and disappears. So you don't have shear jamming for poorly annealed uh, glasses, which is probably the case in colloids, in granulars. I mean, okay, then there is friction, but... Uh, so, okay. With friction is different. I mean, frictionless, not well annealed glasses would not shear jam. And the other thing that is interesting... Sorry? Why they share them? Why? No. It's the output of the calculation, sure. but uh, no. shut up and compute. You know? <laughs> uh, that's the philosophy here. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, a hand waving explanation is, is that. Even under shear, you should you should still be able to reach the isostatic uh, contact numbers, which uh, which you can in principle above the phi j min, the lowest phi j mm. threshold uh, density. Uh, but that's yeah, um, mm. not not uh, a very good explanation. Okay, and the last thing I wanted to mention. Um, maybe the next to last, uh, is that also you, here you see the pressure versus, versus strain, and you see that when you uh, strain, you increase the pressure. Okay, at, in this region where you share jam, the pressure goes to infinity, so the one over pressure goes to zero, but also when you yield, the pressure increases, which is an effect called dilatancy, so it is reproduced by, by mean field. Um, Yes, the last, very, very last thing I want to show is uh, the case of attractive colloids. This is a very recent work. So we took again this potential uh, sticky sphere, uh, sorry, uh, um, square well uh, potential, um, narrow enough, with, with, with a narrow enough uh, attractive uh, part. And then we start from glasses in these three points. So in one point you have coexistence, let's say, of the two glasses, and then you have two other points that are close. And what you see... What you see... Okay. Is that... So here you have the two glasses. So the attractive glass has a much bigger uh, shear modulus, and this is intuitive because the idea is that the attractive glass is due to bonding between particles. Maybe you are going to discuss... Maybe you already did... No, you're not going to discuss. Anyway, so the attractive glass is made by bonding, so the cage is very small, and you can show that in the theory, but also intuitively, I mean, the shear modulus is essentially the inverse of the cage uh, size. So the shear modulus of the attractive glass is much bigger, but then it yields four because it's more fragile, and by shearing you can destroy the bonding between the particles, so it will yield and it will go into the other glass that will yield later. And this is not clear, and we would like to do simulations to test this idea, but I think if you prepare your system in equilibrium, it will be in the attractive glass, because you always select the biggest plateau. But then if you yield 
and you go to the other glass. And then now, before yielding, you reverse the strain. Perhaps you could go back to another glass state. So you, in this way, you could see the coexistence of the two glasses, if it's there. We also see a, a phenomenon here where you have the same thing, but actually the repulsive glass has an inverse yielding. So in this case, if you reverse the strain, actually it will yield back to the attractive. So the bonds will reform, and you go back to the attractive glass. And if you keep increasing the density, you go out of the coexistence region, and you have a smooth and reversible stress-strain curve, um, but no monotonic, because essentially because this pinodal loop close, closes at some point. So this is something that we did very recently, and we would like to try to test numerically some, somehow. So uh, that's, the, that's the end. And uh, I don't know, I didn't really spend time on uh, perspectives, uh, but there are many things to be done. I think the most important is to solve the, um, the dynamics, because all this was done using the Franz Parisi approach, but there is a lot of work to solve the dynamics. And also, um, I think then, okay, then the point is, all this is in infinite dimensions, it's mean field. Uh, to what extent it describes real life? This, this is, of course, an ongoing discussion in glasses since uh, very, very long time, but at least the advantage of this is that you can be kind of quantitative in large D, and then you can try to do simulations, as Patrick uh, is, is discussing in his lectures, to try to interpolate systematically and see what features of, which features of the infinite dimensional solution remain and which ones are destroyed by fluctuations in finite D. So I think, yeah, there is a lot of work to be done in, in these directions. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, Francesco, regarding uh, shear banding, uh, yes. this is something that you also see with cyclic deformation, which uh, where it, it's, I think the physics is the same because what you do with cyclic deformation is to anneal the system mm -hmm. as you approach the, the transition. Um, and and uh, now, in terms of uh, what you know, in terms of what is there to explain, I, I just want to have your thoughts on it because it, it's something that does happen fairly, I think, generically. Um, but in, in terms of what, I mean, one thing one could think of doing based on whatever theory you have is, is to then sort of construct uh, a space-dependent uh, sort of Ginsburg-Landau kind of uh, theory where, you know, you, you sort of use other coarse grain considerations to build the space and time dependence. Is that something that would be, has it been? Yes, I think so. I mean, there are two to recent papers that I know. There are probably many other, but there are at least two that I know. One is from Ludovic and the co-works, and one is from uh, Mathieu Viar and co-works, where they start to, I mean, they start from the idea that the yielding is a spinodal point, but it's avoided by some kind of shear band. Yeah? And then they, try to construct a description based on elastoplastic models, which are kind of models where you put space and provides a kind of land out here, if you want, for this kind of phenomena. And then they start to see how this is modified uh, in, uh, in low dimension. And the idea is that this could be very similar to what happens in a random field IZ model in, uh, uh, at zero temperature, where you have a spinodal infinite dimension and it's, and it's modified in infinite D. And the idea is to try to understand if you can map. The dilatancy and the, sh the shear jamming. Mm -hmm. So now it's pretty clear from experiments that in real frictionless systems, there is no dilatancy. This has been proven definitively by people like Fortier and Pulikin doing very careful experiments that if you make your surface completely smooth or if you figure out how to make them frictionless, there is no dilatancy. So then there are two possibilities that you know, the, it's the finite dimension or it's that this in real systems, you cannot create this really anneal. I think this is, it's the second case because I think, I think in the, with, with Yu Liang and the regime numerically, we checked that there is the latency in very, very deeply swapped uh, states. It's a polydispersed hard spheres without friction, and we see the dilatancy. Right? So, so, yes? Uh, dilatancy 
efficiency here is below 5J. Maximum 5J. I don't understand what that means. In experiments, there is a range over which you can create these where there's dilatancy. And there's no, I don't understand what it means to do dilatancy. There are no hard spheres above 5J, right? So what does dilatancy mean? Above 5J. That's why what they I'm are asking. jammed. Uh, then I mean, okay, at least these the latencies for thermal. Arts, what we did here is thermal arts spheres. So it's thermal arts spheres. So at the beginning they are unjammed. We apply strain and we see that the pressure increases. And this, I mean, numerically, in uh, polydispersed 3D art spheres, we see that we see this for very deeply annealed. And I don't remember. Uh, probably we should check if we go. And you see the latency. We see. Latency, but we sh I should so check if the amount of probably it goes down with. I don't remember. I, I can. I don't no, know. but you know, the is, one yeah. experimental consequence is discontinuous shear thickening is does not happen without friction. That's completely mm -hmm. well established. And mm -hmm. if you don't have the latency, you cannot have discontinuous shear thickening. So mm -hmm. those two, so those two are just uh, mirror images of each other. If you okay. have the latency, you're going to create contact <coughs> under shear, and you're going to jam. Mm -hmm. Or you're going to your pressure is going to diverge. Mm -hmm. You don't have it. So, so I think in real systems, mm -hmm. it is true that you don't get dilatancy if you completely kill friction. Mm -hmm. This has been now clearly demonstrated. That that doesn't depend on pack and traction. So, so then my question, I think the, in, the, uh, the interesting question is: Is this a finite dimension effect, or yeah, this is one a... cannot create these really annealed states that one. Yeah, I think the, the big problem, I mean, uh, here I focus on art spheres, but of course creating uh, very dense uh, packings of art spheres beyond MCT is not doable in, uh, in experiments. I mean, colloids are typically always in this region, and grains, uh, I mean, grains have friction and so on. So... Ah, uh, uh, it's a gran... Ah, uh, sorry, it's grains, but okay, even grains will be... Okay. Yes, but I mean, my guess is that this would be close to the threshold line, close to the low density part. And so perhaps, I mean, perhaps all this part is not very relevant for real life in our spheres, while it is probably relevant in uh, soft potentials where you... Viscosity would diverge here for the glass, and in a thermal state, Probably somewhere around here, but this is not clear. It's an open question that I would like to answer. So it's work in progress. So I, I'm here uh, again. I'm here until Saturday night. And uh, if you want to have detailed uh, discussions on anything I said, please write me an email and uh, we, can, uh, we can organize a meeting and discuss.